Hello everyone, welcome to the outcome of the clinical case from this week. So we are going to jam- summarize the finding of, of this case. If you remember, um, otherwise you can go back to the video that was posted on Monday. But this is a six year old female spade greyhound that presented with peracute onset of disoriented uh, mental status. It had an abnormal posture. It was characterized by uh, disorbellate rigidity. Uh, the gait showed that the dog was uh, severely ataxic and the type of ataxia was characterized as vestibulo cerebellar. When we, do the, when we did the part of the neurological examination on the hands-on, the postural reactions were decreased on all four. Um, the spinal reflexes, the muscle, uh, muscle mass and tone, there was normal spinal reflexes, increased muscle tone. And then what we saw in the cranial nerve uh, evaluation, uh, there was a, sp- a pathological spontaneous nystagmus with a decreased menace response bilaterally with normal vision and midriasis on the, on the left eye with wide-net palpebral fissure. There was not any pain uh, on uh, palpation of the head or uh, uh, spine. So if we put all these findings together, uh, would it, where, where would be your neurolocalization? And then can we uh, lateralize right or left? Uh, if you remember on the postural reactions, they were decreased on all four, but on the left side, they were uh, decreased to absent. So let's see, uh, based on those findings, uh, the neurolocalization is to the Cerebellum. So when there is a, the posture of a disrebellate rigidity, that means that there is a dysfunction particularly in the rostral part of the cerebellum. This dog also presented a disoriented mental status with some signs of vestibular dysfunction. And there is an area of the cerebellum that uh, is involved in the vestibular function, and that is known the floculonodular lobe. So somehow, if uh, the posture points to a uh, uh, cerebellar dysfunction, that is very likely that the part of the cerebellum that is the floculonodular lobe is also somehow uh, involved in the dysfunction. And um, in order to, to explain the obvious uh, postural reaction uh, deficits, this uh, uh, paresis uh, that the dog had, uh, there was, it needs to be somehow some involvement of the brainstem. And because it was on the left side, then we talking about probably a left-sided, more obvious um, uh, lesion. Obviously, if you remember, we also had this midriasis on the left eye with this widening of the palpebral fissure. So the question is, can we relate uh, or can we put that dysfunction on this neurolocalization? Let's let's see. But uh, when we talk about the differentials and taking into account the clinical reasoning, uh, this is uh, based on the signalman. It's a six years old female spade greyhound that presented with peracute onset. And this is very, very important to take into consideration peracute onset of uh, non-progressive, so it didn't uh, have any signs of deterioration, potentially uh, left lateralized, but the cerebellar signs were not really lateralized at the time of presentation, no signs of of pain, not pain on on evaluation, and it was mainly localized to the rostral uh, cerebellum. So when we talk about the etiological diagnosis, there are a few um, etiological diagnoses that could be already ruled out. So inflammatory infections, uh, uh, it will not present with this peracute onset of clinical signs. So this dog was totally normal, and in a few minutes, it presented uh, with those obvious neurological deficits. Uh, uh, Again, something anomalous, something metabolic, um, it will not present with such acute uh, um, neurological signs unless the lesion that we are seeing is secondary to a metabolic problem, obviously, that is causing um, the disease that we're talking about or or the condition that we'll talk about now. So we can kind of uh, remove all etiological diagnosis. They don't have any access to toxin, and it's it's not so common to present such a peracute and severe neurological signs uh, with not other systemic signs due to a toxicity. And according to the owner, there was no chance at all that the dog was exposed to any toxic. And the same, the dog was with the owner all the time, so a trauma, it was not uh, on the list because he didn't suffer any 
any trauma. So again, based on the pre presentation, overall based on the peracute onset, vascular, vascular, vascular is, is, is the etiological uh, diagnosis. And if we have to uh, make a list, probably the most likely will be an ischemic encephalopathy. So when we talk about uh, an ischemic uh, encephalopathy, what happens, we have a thromboembolism, and uh, usually they love the rostral uh, cerebral artery. And when that produces this an area, which is um, uh, where the vascular territory has lack of oxygen, and therefore there is a necrotic uh, tissue, which is kind of the core of the infarction due to the decreased cerebral blood flow at that level. Uh, and then it will surround another area, which is kind of the uh, ischemic penumbra. So this is the area that uh, it will show clinical signs because it's affected at the time of presentation, but it's the area that can recover. It's the area that where good oxy oxygenation, good blood pressure, we can potentially recover the functionality of that area. And this is why the, the, the patients, again, can, can improve with the clinical signs. So this is why this, this chemical um, encephalopathy could explain the clinical signs. And then uh, this doc underwent MRI. If you haven't listened or watched the video on the explanation of the MRI, I would strongly recommend that you do so because Fraser uh, is doing an excellent presentation of the MRI of this case and you can see how there were lesions on the left uh, cerebellum, particularly also the rostral part of the cerebellum and some degree of the brainstem involvement main on the on the left side. But again, uh, based on the MRI uh, differentials, they were acute uh, ischemic infarct. There were two areas of uh, chronic um, infarcts. Uh, the owner reported uh, one potentially similar uh, episodes years ago, but the dog recovered very fast and very, uh, with not any obvious signs. And um, the other one didn't, or, or at least what we thought was the lacunar infarct in the right thalamus, uh, the owner didn't report it any clinical signs previously associated to it. So uh, then we had this um, uh, finding was this midriasis with this winded papilla fissure, and then the question is, could could they be associated? And interestingly, they could. What it have been seen, so at this level, at the level of the gray matter of the cerebellum, we have three important uh, nuclei. So we have the fastigial, which is more medial, then we have the interpositor, and then we have the dentate. So what we have seen is that if there is a dysfunctional affection of the interpositor nucleus, it can cause ipsilateral midriasis and widening of the palpebral fissure. And in what we consider one of the Bibles of the um, uh, neurology or clinical neurology uh, is, is written that unilateral ablation abli of the interpositor nucleus has resulted in ipsilateral mitriasis and an incomplete pupillary light reflex with ipsilateral widening of the palpebral fissure. And it's also written that interestingly, we have not yet observed these clinical signs in naturally occurring lesions of the cerebellum. So we have added a little sentence that we have and is, is very interesting because again, you can explain the clinical signs with the, with the same lesion. What happened with these dogs? So this is a recent study but published in 2016 where it just makes the, the, the clinical signs associated with the specific infarct in the rostral cerebral uh, artery. So um, the, when we saw ischemic and strokes, strokes in dogs, um, why the majority or the most common one is seen in the rostral cerebellum still remains unknown. It's interesting that there is a possible um, that the vascular anatomy of the cerebellum plays an important role. Um, uh, it may could uh, cause or predispose dogs the, to have cardiogenic embolism. Uh, the prognosis uh, is good to excellent. They need obviously supported care. And it's important uh, to investigate possible underlying cause, any possible cardiac disease, any kidney dysfunction, any potential uh, diseases that could cause uh, thromboembolisms or embolisms that could, um, if it's found, uh, obviously it should be treated accordingly. In the majority of the dogs, uh, we do not find the underlying cause, and obviously there is not a specific treatment for the potential cause that can be given in those cases. So these dogs should be given supported care. This is the dog just, uh, as you can see, uh, f uh, three days uh, after presentation. It still shows obvious um, uh, uh, deficits on the left side, but uh, the right side has definitely improved. And then uh, when we compare, when we see the dog just 10 days after presentation, uh, is ambulatory with assistant, 
and uh, nearly back to normal. So again, um, the majority of these dogs, just a few days after uh, the onset, should start showing improvement on, on the clinical signs. And, and because uh, the cerebellum, what is the most important uh, function of the cerebellum is making coordinated movements. They don't really have to play piano. They don't really have to do skilled movements with the, with the toe. So uh, again, the majority of the dogs, they recover uh, very well and they can have a, a very good quality of life. Again, it's very important that we investigate for possible underlying cause as that can uh, predispose to have further strokes anywhere in, in the system. And if that can be treated, obviously it uh, should be treated, uh, as I said, the possible underlying cause. I hope you like the, the, the case and if you have any question, please post it and we will be um, very happy to, to answer. Thank you.